So we're in a coffee shop, sort of. We're no, in a we're tavern. Not. We're not. In a, we're not in a coffee shop. We're in a tavern. Why are you lying? We're in, a, we're in an empty tavern. It's a completely we're a, organic. We're in, a, we're in a pub. It's That's an organic. Just... It's an empty space. It's so a pub. It's a pub. So module bundling is a thing. Yep. It's one of those other things that make us cry on a daily basis, to be honest. But it's a necessary evil because then we get all the years 2015 goodness today. You've now. been you've been dealing with a lot of the tools that end in ify or iffy. Browserify, Babelify, Rollupify is my current FI set. Because I tried Babel and Rollup without the iffy bits and um, it didn't work. Somewhere someone envies you. It's not me, but someone. No, probably they don't. Does. No so one does. we should we should probably <laughs> talk about what all that stuff is. Yeah, you tell me how to fix it, and that'd be great. It's not happening. So browserify, <laughs> browserify. We'll start off with browserify. Um, it's a tool for compiling your Node-flavored CommonJS modules into the browser. It's basically stuff you grab off npm. Um, it'll analyze your require calls, um, build a bundle that you can serve up to the browser using a script tag. It's pretty. Yeah. Pretty so basically, cool. when you do like require brackets, whatever you put inside, what it does is it looks at that file and then just basically inlines it into one single JavaScript file. So then you create a JavaScript bundle. Yeah, so basically packages published to NPM originally intended for Node will just work in the browser, which is kind of nice for little utilities and stuff like that. Yeah. Using it's pretty straightforward. So you go and require something like, I don't know, a module called Magic. There probably is a, I don't even want to look it up. You've made it. I haven't made it. You have. Well, carry on. Okay, so let's say that you've required in a module called Unicorn. You can then go and start using it, like do unicorn.dance. You go and run Browserify against it to generate a bundle. And when you try it out in the browser, it'll go and log a message. Dance like nobody is watching because you. Because they're not. I'll always watch you dance, Addy. And that's where the lawyers come in. So um, we talked about Browserify. Yep. We'll come back to that. Uh, we also have to mention Webpack. So. Webpack. Webpack is like the new hotness, and I've not looked at it because last time I spoke to you using this, you seem like you're in severe pain. I had a bucket next to my desk for my tears. <laughs> it just came from Webpack. So Webpack, it's great. It's useful. It's just it's not the nicest thing to use. So Webpack is another module bundler. It packs your CommonJS modules, your AMD modules in the browser. Um, it has a few other features. It's got like things like loaders for transforming resources in, you know, into JavaScript. So you could take something like JSX, just load it in. It'll do all the transformations for you. Yep. Loaders are sort of like tasks in other build tools. So you'd use it as a way to get you sort of front-end build steps-ish. Mm, like, this is the thing. Like, I'm, I'm struggling to figure out what it does over Browserify and everything else. OK, let's, so let's ignore anything that I've said there. The, the, the main thing that I like Webpack for is a feature called code splitting. right? So okay. code splitting lets you basically split your code base into chunks. And you can then go and load them on demand. Um, it's kind of nice. So does it just have a cross-browser way of loading in these extra chunks of JavaScript? Yeah, basically you can say you can configure what you, know, what you want, how, how it is that you want to um, split your code base up. And it'll just figure out the rest. It's kind of nice. Okay. Um, it also has this other feature called hot module replacement. Have you have you heard of that before? No. It sounds great. It's HMR. <laughs> um, so that's used to inject updated modules into your active runtime. So let's say that we had like a I don't know a chat widget of some sort. Yep. Um, that relied on a bunch of different modules, and some of those modules ended up getting updated. You could inject like the updates into your active running runtime and just get it working. Fair enough. It's kind of cool. It's like live reload for every module. Sort of. But on live, yeah, it's extra code. live, super like live. production. Yeah, live, live. Um, using Webpack's pretty straightforward. Go and install it globally. Run it against your app to go and generate a bundle, and then just include it using some script tags. It's pretty, pretty straightforward. It's got nice. a config file as well. Everything's got to have its own config. Yeah, Babel. these days. Yeah. Um, you're probably wondering what the difference between Webpack and you, you don't you don't care anymore. You're just you're just dead on the inside. No, I, I I can kind of see there being some advantages, but at the same time, I don't think I'd ever use the Webpack features. What's wrong? What's wrong with you? Well, Browserify just makes sense, and if I could get away with not using Browserify, then I would. But I can't. So picking picking you know a, a choice between Webpack and Browserify is a little bit more nuanced than just. You know, saying they both do the same thing. If if you only care about features, it depends on the features. Like if you want the code splitting or the hot module replacement, go and use Webpack. Yep. Browserify is a little bit smaller and more modular. Um, 
lets you go and you know, uh, select plugins and compose them with transforms. It's nice. Webpack, I would say, brings more features um, to the table, and it puts those in core. Um, but they're both pretty extensible, so try them both out. Use whatever makes sense. Yeah. Moving on, uh, Sam Sikon recently put together this uh, repo uh, called the cost of transpiling ES2015 to ES2016, and he tried out a whole range of different module bundling strategies. Um, he found out that there were like some some very small differences. You know, once you start pairing like Browserify and Babelify, your Webpack configs and, and other bits and pieces, um, the numbers, you know, they they vary slightly. Yeah. But you don't start really seeing huge wins until you try out like closure or roll up. Have you tried yep. out roll up before? I, I've added it now, like because I think we had this discussion of why would you need roll up in a browserify, babelify world? And it was the tree shaking. Yeah, so um roll up assumes in, in some cases that you're gonna be probably working with ES2015 modules and it's got this nice feature called tree shaking that um, excludes your unused exports from bundles. Uh, Webpack to beta, I want to say, um, has got support for tree shaking as well. Okay, yeah. If people want to stick with Webpack, um, but it's a useful feature, good for eliminating um, sort of dead code that you don't really need. Uh, I believe Richard Harris has got a good blog post on Medium that explains the differences between tree shaking and dead code elimination and how all of that stuff plays out. Mm. It's worth checking out, but Rollup's pretty straightforward to use. Just go install it globally, specify what format you want your output bundle to take, whether it's common JS or what have you, and it just does its thing. Um, as it turns out, Rollup's output was a few kilobytes smaller. I think I read somewhere that a few people trying this stuff out have found, like, on average, they were getting 20 or 30 percent wins nice. using Rollup. That's again assuming you're playing around with the S2015 modules. But presumably, as you use it more and more, the wins might actually grow as well. If more libraries are using yeah. the S2015, yeah. yeah. Um, but also, this is this is a nice little visual from Sam. Basically, it, the TLDR is closure actually ends up giving you the smallest size if you're looking at module bundling stuff. We didn't even talk about closure. Yeah, at all. But um, people should check out this repo. It's a good helper for roughly guessing what's going to be useful and running through its runtime. Yeah, and it's nice seeing all the options. I think the thing is, is it comes down to a point of what works for your project and is the easiest for you to work with. I, I, because like there's no clear winner on there to the point where it's like, oh, if you clearly do all this pain, you're going to get to a nice clear like reduction in file size. It's going to be minimal. Yes. So if you're not using an if I tool in your current workflow, well, Webpack doesn't have an if I in it. Exactly. We've got Webpack if I. See, the saddest thing is I can see it happening next week now. Web, <laughs> Webpack if I. Well, that's our job, slowly making JavaScript worse on a week to week basis. 